Hello everyone, how are you doing? Thank you for turning up on this beautiful Monday, is it? Is it Monday today? I don't even know the days of the week. Anyway, it's Christmas time and it is uh, a Monday and um, I'm very excited about this um, event this evening. Um, we have got the pleasure of Mr. William Porter, um, who has um, taken the time to write this education. In fact, it's not his first. This is actually Alcohol Explained 2. He actually wrote the first one in 2015. I think that was right. Just put your uh, hand up, Will, um, before I let him in. Um, and uh, this is full of some very interesting information. And I really, I, I was actually saying when I was listening to this over the weekend and, and, and dissecting it all, that um, I wish I had that information when I was making that decision around drink. I think I would have stopped a lot earlier. But anyway, we're gonna be um, taking some of that knowledge tonight and, and speaking to, to William, allowing uh, the floor, so to speak, and allow him to, to um, discuss his um, research into alcohol. Uh, but first of all, I'd just like to mention a couple of stats. Um, and that is, this is something, I don't know if this person's actually on the, um, on the webinar tonight, um, but this is one that hit me tonight. And that is, I think this was by who, Laura? Cancer Research. Cancer Research. And this is thanks to Sober in the City on Instagram. If you're on the uh, call tonight, then thank you very much. But if alcohol was only just discovered and was to go through today's food safety testings, the maximum recommended amount we could consume per year is one glass of wine. One glass of wine. In order, and that's in order to avoid the seven types of cancers it is associated with. So anyway, look, I don't want this to be about demonizing alcohol per se. And this is not specific to any person on this, uh, on this webinar. This is merely a means of information that you can take, and then you can use that information to make an informed decision about what you want to do. But talking from my own personal perspective, and we'll hear William's story as well, um, stopping alcohol or stopping drinking alcohol was the best thing I ever did. And the reason I say that is because there seems to be this uh, sort of stigma attached to non-drinkers that we're forever living in this recovery mode and, and always wanting to, to, you know, really wanting to drink, but holding ourselves back from doing so. And it's painful and it's torturous. And I can tell you now that is absolutely ridiculous. And the freedom for me is in not drinking. So my life is absolutely brilliant. And I put that down to the fact, or, or, or one of the facts is the fact that I stopped drinking. And that has opened up so many other things in my life that I'm now value a lot more um, closely to my heart than I used to do drinking. So um, I'd like to just share a little bit of my story with you. But um, for those, I'm pretty sure a lot of you do know, but for those of you that don't, I pretty much um, drank from a very young age, probably 14 was my first drink. I, I was born in a brewery town, Burton-on-Trent, Staffordshire. My family was probably, most of my family were paid were paid in alcohol. It was ridiculous. It was always around. Um, and then I joined the military, the Royal Marines initially, and it's just a massive drinking culture. So it really amplified everything I'd sort of learned from an early age anyway. Um, I went through my whole career just absolutely hammering uh, the bottle. I, I didn't really... Oh, I'd like to say this, actually. I actually, looking back now, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but it didn't win any wars. I actually ruined my career in the military because of my drinking habits and, and the fact that I had this whole attitude, well, I work hard enough, drink, blah, blah. And it was, it was like, it was either work or drink. Um, and I look back on that time of my life and I actually caused myself so many problems um, throughout that period because of the fact I was drinking. I then left went across to Iraq as a contractor, got myself into some absolutely crazy situations where I nearly lost my life uh, under the influence, um, came away from that. And uh, then I was, found myself in South Southeast Asia. Um, and although I was doing some amazing things, rescuing kids over there, I was still hitting the bottle pretty hard. I came back from there, Australia, 
I was living at the time and I crashed and burned big time. I crashed and burned in such a way that I was starting to think about suicide. And um, it was at that point, I actually took responsibility for where I was, you know, and this is something we do as humans. We're always blaming the external world for our failures. We're blaming the external world or looking to the external world for our success, happiness, everything else. It's not out there. It is within. And I realized that in that tight spot where I stopped blaming the outside world and took responsibility for that. And that was the start of my sort of uh, my road or my journey um, out of alcohol. At that time, I told myself I could never stop. And I went into this hole where I'm going to learn to moderate it, learn to control it. And that was just a battle uh, beyond belief. Um, and then I got to the point, 2016, filming SAS Who Dares Wins in, um, in Ecuador, South America. And uh, I said, right, I'm going to give myself eight weeks and not drink because uh, I want to give the best performance ever um, for the next show. And um, I got to the end of that eight weeks. We finished filming and Foxy, one of the lads, came up and said, come on, let's get smashed. And for the first time ever, I took a breath, thought about it and said no. I just said, mate, I'm feeling so good. I've got so much clarity. I'm going to give it a pass. He looked at me like I was a lunatic. He never thought I would, he would ever hear those words from me. And that was the start of my journey to sobriety, which is the best thing ever. I did actually go back to drinking, which was eight months back on, on the juice, thinking I could control it. Um, and I learned at the end of that eight months that I was just going back to the same old person that I was before, the person that I hated, the person I loathed, the person that lacked self-worth. And I, that was the last time I drank, 2018, 19, 2019. And uh, we'll not go back to it ever again. So anyway, without further ado, I'd just like to say one further stat that I've got as well, because we're doing uh, a lot of sort of work with alcohol change. This is something we took from their fact sheet from their website. And this really did knock me off my feet. It's 167,000 working years are lost to alcohol every year in the UK. 167,000 years. I thought those figures were wrong, but it is actually right. Anyway, enough of stats, enough of my boring story. I want to bring in the guest tonight, which is um, uh, William Porter, the author of Alcohol Explained and Alcohol Explained 2. And uh, we're going to have a bit of a conversation. William's going to give you some of his uh, knowledge tonight, which is absolutely golden. Hello, William. How are you? I'm very good. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure, mate. It's a real, uh, real pleasure to have you on this uh, on the platform with me. And um, it, those of you that know Breakpoint, we are a company, a company that is focused on helping people to change their lives, whether that's through their mindset, through their choices they make. Um, so this is the meaning and the purpose for, for getting you on board tonight, William. So, so thanks so much for that. Um, just as a sort of for those people that you've obviously got some people that have come to this webinar that do know you, but for just for, for the people that don't know you on this on, on the on the call tonight, could you just give us a, a brief summary of who you are and why you decided to write Alcohol Explained? Yeah, absolutely. It's funny enough, it's not an entirely dissimilar story to you, Ollie, because I started drinking when I was 14 as well. And the point of drinking for me and my mates was always to go out and get as drunk as you possibly could. So we'd go out and get as drunk as we could Friday. We do the same Saturday, kind of recover Sunday and go back to work. And that was always kind of almost like, like you described it, like what you're entitled to do. You work hard, you play hard. That's your reward at the end of the week. Um, and then it started to sour over the decades and it started to go, you know, I remember being like a teenager um, and going out and getting hammered on a Friday and then sitting in the pub on a Saturday, really trying to drink beer, but just not being able to face it because I drunk too much the night before. And over the years, it became the opposite. So the more I drunk the night before, the more desperate I was to have a drink the next day to kind of get back to normal and start to feel normal. So those drinking binges just got longer and longer. And I think there were a few things I could point to that were real like watershed moments. One of which was whenever I drank alcohol, I'd always wake up in the middle of the night, unable to get back to sleep. And what I found was if you have a couple of drinks, you relax and go back to sleep, which, you know, it, it seemed like a really good idea at the time. But then you start opening up that door to just constant drinking. 
So I'd, you know, I'd drink Friday, wake up in the early hours, Saturday morning, get up, drink in the middle of the night, fall back to sleep and just sort of keep going and going and going. Um, and things came for a head to me in February 14. So it's going to be 10 years this coming February where I sort of crawled out of this five day drinking binge. I think I'd gone out for a business lunch on the Tuesday and I just drank and drank and drank. And I kind of came out sort of Saturday afternoon. I hadn't been into work all week. I'd been ringing in sick. Wife had gone. The kids had gone. I was just at home on my own in this complete mess. Um, and, and that was the point for me where it was like, I, I cannot keep doing this. I'd had periods before of stopping. So I knew I could stop for periods, but I was always being sucked back into it. Um, but that, as I say, that February 2014, that was the last time I sort of came out of that in the mindset that I, I cannot keep doing this. But equally, I kind of had quite a negative mindset because people often say to me, oh, like, were you really gung ho for it when you started? And the answer was no, because I, I was waking up then, apart from the fact I felt like death. But the other fact of the matter is it's like I can't keep doing this. I have to stop. But it's the only way I can deal with stress. And how am I going to go and enjoy a holiday without drinking? And how am I going to go out with my mates without? And what's Christmas going to be like? So I had all these doubts and fears about it. Um, but like the only thing I knew is that I had to stop. Yeah. Um, and so much of your story, I mean, like I was talking, you were relating to my story, but that's where it really started for me, because I can remember I was actually, I was in Australia, I was actually living in Australia, and I lived on my own, um, which was a blessing and a curse at the same time, but um, I can remember that, you know, I used to go out, and I used to come in, and then I, I used to, it was a regular routine of mine that I would like wake up, I, there's no way I was going to get back to sleep. All I had to do was like knock a few drinks back and then that would wipe me out again. So um, yeah, so much of that um, really resonates with me as well. I think what kind, so what kind of drink, I mean, you talk in your book about types of drinkers and um, you know, it's been interesting actually today because um, we saw the, or I put the advert on for this chat um, on, on my Instagram and, and, and other mediums. And um, it's, it's funny because people then start being really defensive about their own drinking and stuff. And, and then, you know, what I do is almost like, you know, I'm questioning them directly when it's like, you know, I'm not asking you to de defend your right as a drinker. You know, this is really just about the facts and stuff, but there are different types of drinkers, aren't there? That um, what type of drinker were you? So I was I was a binge drinker. So there were periods. So so I worked out quite. So I'm a solicitor at the moment. So when I go into work, I have to use my brain. And what I worked out quite early on, I couldn't do my job if I'd been drinking. So I was I would whenever I was working, I would not drink. So this is my usual drinking pattern. I'd start. It, it was getting longer and longer, but I would start maybe Friday lunchtime, and then I would drink constantly for the weekend it sort of ended up with then I'd be drinking on a Sunday then you wake up feeling awful on a Monday but I was always a binge drinker and I always stopped in between so moderate yeah. drinking for me was just never something I did so really at uh, the end of the day it's, that's exactly the same as me as well William and that was you know I think a lot of that, that culture as well I'm not saying that caused it I'm just saying that really amplifies that kind of that mm. kind of behavior you know it's like work hard play hard kind of thing but um uh, really I think what when it came to drinking was it the fact you was it just you drank to get drunk yeah I think I think it started off drinking to get drunk so it started off as a teenager so you're kind of and, and this is sort of start some of the dynamics I started to, to sort of work out with it because I spent a lot of time when I got to sort of the end of my drinking career because I was drinking constantly and I was like intoxicated, I started to not like drinking with people. You know, mm. I might go out for an evening and have a few drinks, but I actually just wanted to get home so I could drink what I wanted to drink. But I couldn't really do that in front of people because I'd be falling all over the place. So I spent an awful lot of time sitting around almost wondering what I was doing it for and sort of picking it to pieces. So I mm. sort of I started off drinking for social reasons. And I think it's true for a lot of people, you know, at 14, you kind of, you like being out with your mates, but it's also quite nerve wracking. You know, you're meeting girls. You don't really, <laughs> not that I know any better now particularly, <laughs> but you know, you don't really know how to react to, around people. You feel a lot of social anxiety and yeah. alcohol seems to work really well. 
because it is a sedative. So if Mm. you're feeling nervous, having a couple of drinks does actually make you feel pretty good. Um, Mm. So I think that was the starting point for me. Um, But what I found was when I was drinking, I found it harder and harder to stop. And what I found was, you know, talking about people defending their drinking and like, oh, but, you know, I drink moderately. What I found with moderate drinking is I didn't enjoy it. I did try on a few occasions to just have one or two. But I just found I didn't like it. I would rather have no drinks than one or two. And that always kind of puzzled me because I was always like, well, you know, like if I'm hungry, I would rather have one slice of pizza than none. If if you said, oh, you can have the whole pizza, fine, I'll eat the whole pizza. But if you just said to have one, I'd just have one. And I couldn't quite work out the dynamic with alcohol. Yeah. Um, and, and that was when I started to piece it together because, you know, we quite often think of alcohol, people equate it to like a food, like you want it, you have some, and it satisfies that desire. But alcohol isn't a food, it's a drug. It's a sedative, a depressant. And when I use the word depressant, I'm using it in its chemical sense as something that decreases or inhibits nerve activity. Okay, and I think most people are on board with that. So you take a drink and you feel slightly more relaxed or intoxicated than you did before. But of course, your brain reacts to it. Your brain has a huge array of chemicals, drugs and hormones, and it releases them at exactly the right times and exactly the right um, quantities to make you feel like alive and well. Yeah. Okay, and when that brain chemistry is working well, that's generally when you feel at your most resilient and feel at your best. Now, when you introduce a drug like alcohol, your brain reacts to it and it does it in lots and lots of different ways. It, for example, it releases things like adrenaline and cortisol, which is a stress hormone. But what it's really doing, it's becoming hypersensitive so that it can work under the sedating effects of the alcohol. Right. Mm-hmm. That's what tolerance is. You know, when you yeah. start drinking alcohol, you might have a couple of beers and just all over the place. But 10, 15, 20 years down the line, you can knock back huge amounts. You know, if you drank that kind of amount right at the beginning, it would kill you. A lot of people, you know, we, we're on board. Oh, yeah, you become more tolerant. But not many people stop and think, well, what's actually changed to allow you to drink that amount of the poison? Yeah. And the answer is your brain becomes better and better at um, um, countering the sedating effects of the alcohol, which yeah. is fine. But when the alcohol wears off, that overstimulation, all that cortisol and stress hormone is left there, making you feel really anxious and unpleasant. Now, there's two ways you can get rid of that unpleasant feeling. One is to wait a few days till your brain chemistry gets back to normal and then you feel fine again. But of course, (laughs) no, no, no. Who wants to feel rubbish for a few days? There's a much quicker way and that's to have another drink because the reason you're feeling rubbish is because your brain's geared up to work under the stating effects of the alcohol, but there's no alcohol. So yeah. introduce a drink and you immediately feel a lot better. And that's what I started to cotton on to, that I was going through these horrendous drinking sessions and it was all triggered towards trying to feel relaxed and comfortable how I would have felt had I not had the drink in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people on the uh, on the webinar, actually, this resonates with so many people. I just like to say, I, I always say, I've said this a lot in talks, um, you know, that I've given around my relationship with alcohol, that I've always maintained that, you know, you don't have a problem with drinking, you have a problem that's causing you to drink. And really, for me, you know, a lot of people say, well, I've not really had any problems. And I think a lot of it, you know, it was used, and you've mentioned it there, William, it was used at some point in your life to mask an emotion. Do you know what I mean? And that's especially when you're young, you know, the peer pressure of going out or it's, it's, you know, it's a secret. Your parents don't know. It's, you know, it's like it's a bit taboo and everything else. And you want to be in, in with the crowd. So there's that. But there's also the facts. And I mean, everyone can relate to that. You you drink because you need to rent that personality. You're renting a personality to go out and be someone that you're really not. And then really, so that becomes your go-to. But then as you then evolve through your life, you then use it in all different facets of different issues. That becomes your go-to, doesn't it? It's the same, yeah. it works the same way, the same mechanism. Um, so uh, there was an interesting fact. That was really, well, there's loads of interesting facts in this book. I advise everyone to get a copy of this. Um, it, it'd be great for a stocking filler for those people that are hammering Christmas Day anyway. Uh, <laughs> but anyway... Um, one of the things that I think you kind of touched on it there is the fact, well, there's a couple of points, and that is the people think they're getting that euphoria from the alcohol. 
am I right in saying, have I read this right by saying it's not the euphoria of the alcohol because the alcohol is an absolute depress depressant and it's mm -hmm. actually your body is trying to equalize. So that yeah. that then you sorry if you could if you complain you um, explain that William please yeah yeah there's, so there's a few different ways alcohol can make you feel good and the most obvious way is when you're for a lot of people when they start drinking it's when they're in social situations so as human beings you you'll have heard of endorphins okay I think most people have heard of endorphins if you've not heard of them it's a naturally occurring chemical in the brain that your brain releases and it makes you feel really good you feel really happy and you just feel great I, I always kind of think of endorphins as like a, a survival thing because your brain gives you a dose of endorphins when you do something either good for you personally or good for the species right so if you have sex if you exercise, if you eat a healthy meal when you're hungry, all of these things, your brain releases endorphins. It's to reward you and to make you keep doing these things to keep the, you know, yourself and the species going. Um, one of the other things, your brain, which I, I find this quite interesting, but another time your brain releases endorphins is when you're relaxed and socializing with people, which I think is one quite an interesting insight into humans and how we are meant to communicate with other people to share ideas and knowledge and all the rest of it but be that as it may the simple dynamic is when you're relaxed and socializing with someone you get an endorphin hit right now I've already talked about the dynamic most people when they go to social events they have a degree of social anxiety right so mm -hmm. you're turning up at a social event you're a bit nervous, what are people are going to think of me, what am I going to say, blah, blah, blah. So you've got that social anxiety. There's two ways to get rid of social anxiety. One is to just wait and chat to people. And eventually, hopefully, you'll get into conversation with someone you like. It'll be interesting and you'll forget all that background noise about what do I look like? What will they think of me? And you just get immersed in this conversation. If you get to that point, you'll get your endorphin rush. You start to really enjoy yourself. But again, mm. we've just spoken about how we like things quicker. So if you take a sedative, you kind of take a shortcut there because you're taking this anesthetic, you're anesthetizing the nerves. So your brain releases the endorphins slightly quicker. So when people start drinking, they think, oh, alcohol makes me feel really good. It doesn't. The, what we ascribe as the good feeling is actually an endorphin rush. What you get when you're socializing and drinking is endorphins and alcohol, okay? Mm -hmm but we ascribe it to the alcohol. It's a very fascinating experiment. If you've stopped drinking, obviously don't do this, but if you're still drinking, something that's really interesting is to drink your normal amount of alcohol. We're often told don't drink alone, but do it on your own. No music, no TV, no nothing. Just sit in an empty, quiet room and drink alcohol, okay? It does not make you feel good. OK, mm. you just feel weird. You still feel slightly tunnel vision, slightly uncomfortable. The one caveat there is if you're drinking regularly, it might make you feel better than you did before, because don't forget, you've got that withdrawal. The brain's countering the alcohol. It's leaving you feel slightly unconscious, it's not slightly unpleasant, slightly anxious. It's like when you drink too much caffeine. It's that what we call anxiety, that anxious feeling you get after you've been drinking. But if you haven't had a drink for a few days and that's gone and you have a drink, it doesn't actually make you feel that good. Mm. yeah no it's really interesting i think it's um you know because i i until i read your book actually i just thought that was the alcohol that was an effect of the alcohol that it just you know that's the end that's the sort of euphoria and everything else but mm. bottom line is you and, and i can speak from a sober mind now you know me, me and my wife have been sober for a long time and um you know we still can go and meet people now and we have that as soon as you're with people in that community you get that buzz you get yeah. you know they you get that real euphoria and i think a lot of the things that people are chasing through alcohol they don't realize that they can get that anyway yeah. without doing something later on through the night that that uh, they regret or, or waking up the next morning with a hangover so you know everything you're chasing with alcohol you can have a, a much better and sustained level if you just give yourself a break and, and got off the alcohol, is that, that's correct, isn't it? Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a key point that you just said there, Wally, about sustained because, and, and this is a fascinating thing. If you're not drinking, we've got the you know Christmas party season coming up. It's really interesting to go to these events because that sustained is absolutely true. If you're not drinking and you go to a social event, 
it might take you a bit longer to settle into it. But when you settle into it, you get that endorphin high, that nice feeling for the entire evening. But when you're drinking alcohol, you might get the endorphin rush a bit earlier. But because you then keep drinking, which you have to do, because every alcoholic drink, as it disappears, it leaves an unpleasant feeling that needs another drink to relieve it. You become increasingly intoxicated and that actually anesthetizes the feeling of euphoria you get. And like Mm. I say, it's it's Christmas season. If you go out and watch people drinking, it's really interesting because when people are drinking, they get that buzz. They start to be really and they're really enjoying. You can see they're enjoying themselves for the first hour or two. And then the alcohol starts to kick in and the, the mood dips a bit. People get a bit more argumentative. It gets and that initial euphoria really does a nosedive. But it's yeah. funny because we, we only think about the euphoric part of it. And you don't often think that, you know, if you're drinking for four or five hours, you've maybe got half an hour, 40 minutes, an hour of actually feeling good. And then you yeah. kind of do a bit of a nosedive and sit there kind of as when you sort of get bad temper. That's when the fights break out and all the rest of it. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. Um, another point is um, also, you know, when it comes to um, eating, because obviously I've read it, I, you know, I, th- I think I, I knew this, but I think you you sort of explained it in a, in a lot better uh, way in your book, but um, is the fact that when you actually have alcohol, it suppresses the receptors that would otherwise tell you that you're full, you, you yeah. know, you've, you know, so basically this is why you can go out, have eight pints of lager and then decide to go for a curry. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You imagine how small your stomach is. And you're like eight mm-hmm. pints of lager and a curry on top of that, a load of naan bread and everything else. How do you do that? You know, and that's yeah. it's, it's all the receptors, doesn't it, in your stomach, which allows you just to eat anything basically. And this is why people yeah. lose weight. Especially, it's, it's an in- yeah, it's an interesting one because people often talk about alcohol as being an appetite stimulant, which people might be watching that thinking, "Well, hang on, you just said it's a sedative, it's a depressant. How can it be a stimulant as well? They're two polar opposites." But it's quite interesting. So so for this, you need to just understand a little bit about how the human digestive system works. Now, when you eat food, it has to go through something like 20 foot of digestive tract. Right. And there's muscles that squeeze it all the way. So it actually takes a huge amount of energy to eat food. So your body, your body is predisposed to make you want to eat when you're sat and relaxed. OK, this is why things like nicotine, caffeine, amphetamine, stimulants remove your appetite and adrenaline as well. If you have a massive shock or fear or something kicks in, you're not hungry OK? because your body does not want you eating when you might have to run or fight or do something physical. So your mm. body triggers hunger when you're sat down relaxing alcohol is a sedative so when you take it it makes you feel like eating so yeah. it does that and at the same time you're absolutely right it's anesthetizing the receptors that tell you that you're full and of course there's a huge amount of calorie empty calories in in beer i forget how many calories there are in a pint of beer and a glass of wine but it's like 100 or 200 calories yeah. so if, you, if, you, if you're talking about drinking a few drinks it's the equivalent of topping your meal off with like a, a kebab or a <laughs> <laughs> a quarter pounder with cheese or something it's massive yeah absolutely crazy um i think uh it's interesting because there's a lot of people on here that i want to i want to sort of discuss those that think you know the, the kind of response where people go well i only have the odd drink from time to time and i know something in your book and it's a question everyone wants to sort of know that what's your thoughts on that moderation you know if it's someone that's saying well, you know, I know only have a couple of drinks at the weekend. What, what, what are you, what's your advice to those kind of people or your thoughts on that whole mentality ethos? So, so I think I'm very much on board with what you said right at the beginning. The point of certainly alcohol explain is to give people information and that people take that information away. And, and really, it's up to them. It's their prerogative to do with what they will. What I would say is you need to stop thinking of it as, as something that's kind of all right in small doses if I sat in front of you and said, I only smoke a couple of cigarettes a week, would you be thinking, oh, that's good? Or would you be thinking, what an idiot? Um, If I said I inject heroin a couple of times a week, what would you be thinking to that? And and people might kind of, well, alcohol is not like heroin. And it's like, well, it isn't only because so many people take it. So being reliant on it is normalized. So if people are sat there saying to me, 
I only have alcohol a couple of times a week, I would be saying, why do you need alcohol? It's a drug. And shouldn't the ideal be not needing a drug? Mm. Um, and we use a lot of language around alcohol that kind of, to my mind, normalizes the addiction. If, if I turn around to a room of people and say to them, hands up who thinks a night out with your mates is more fun if you've had a few drinks mm -hmm. everyone sticks their hand up right it's a no you have more fun if you've had a few drinks but if I say to the same room of people hands up who is psychologically if not physically dependent on a drug to such an extent you can no longer fully enjoy life without it no one puts their hand up right but it's the same question if yeah. you're saying you have more fun with this drug, what you're really saying is I can't fully enjoy myself without this drug. Um, mm. And my question would be, why do you need it? People will say I need it to socialize. I need it to relax. But you didn't need it before you started taking it. You know, if my 12 year old son is upset at school, you know, you sit down and you talk to him. I, I wouldn't in a million years offer him a drink. <laughs> that would be insane. But what's the difference between adults doing it and children doing it? Simply because children haven't become relying on it. It's exactly what you mentioned before, Rolly. It's a sedative. So it mm. becomes our go-to. It becomes our go-to when we're stressed, when we're relaxed, when we're stressed, when we want to sleep, when we want to socialize. It becomes our go-to little crutch. Whether mm. you're reliant on it once or twice a week or constantly is, to me, a matter of degrees. If you're just drinking once or twice a week then great, the harm is greatly reduced, but I would mm. still be questioning why you need to do it. Now, the other thing just to mention here as well is its effect on sleep. Mm. Alcohol has a massive effect on sleep. I don't know if you've read Why We Sleep by Matt Walker, but it's a really yeah. fascinating read. Um, so he, he's an English scientist. He, he's I think most people consider him to be the, the forefront researcher on sleep. He doesn't even describe what we experience when we've been drinking as sleep. He says yeah. it's alcohol induced unconsciousness. When you sleep naturally, you go through very specific sleep cycles. Your body rejuvenates, your brain rejuvenates. It's incredibly good for you. It's the best thing you can do for your mental health, for feeling physically and mentally good is to sleep alcohol stops you sleeping mm. so if someone is sat there saying i only drink twice a week i would be thinking why are you ruining your sleep twice a week and don't forget when we're talking about alcohol it's not a question of i only drink one therefore it doesn't affect me it's like, i only drink one so it only ruins my sleep a smaller amount than if i had three drinks or four drinks or six drinks yes. so and again that would be my reaction to it It'd be like you do what you want to do. That's entirely your prerogative. But I would be questioning why you need to take a drug that's ruining your sleep and all the knock on effects that that's going to have when you yeah. don't need to. Yeah, 100 percent. I think at the end of the day, you know, it's like you talked about heroin and it's the same. It's, it's almost like I mean, me and my wife were having a chat before. It's almost like saying, you know, if you're, uh, you know, you're taking cocaine and, you know, someone said, well, I only have one line now when I when I go for a family function. It's like it's, it is no different, is it? It, no. at, at day, it is a drug that has an effect on your body, regardless of the amount you put in. It has so many different um, well, there are issues at the end of the day, aren't they? Mm. It affects your mental um, clarity, your productivity, and then also your physical as well. Um, one thing I'd like to sort of um, question because stress is the biggest killer on this planet. Regardless, I think it's 80 to 90 percent of people visiting the doctor. It's all down to stress. You know, the basis of it is stress. And what basically happens when you were in that constant state of stress? I mean, and, and you've only got to look at the media today. I mean, there's a reason. There's two things that will grab your attention when it comes to our survival instinct. And that is sex and death. Those two things will grab your attention in front beyond anything you're doing. As soon as that's in front of you, it will grab your attention. It's just a survival instinct. And that is why the media is so focused on everything. He's got to grab that attention. Um, but really, a, any kind of, or any organism that is living in that constant state of stress will at some point suffer with dis-ease in the body. That is illness, dis-ease in the body. 
And no, no, actually no organism on this planet can actually live in that heightened sense of stress without having real significant issues down the track. And uh, you've only got, for me personally, when I was going like, I had a crazy um, incident when I was a kid that kind of put me into this hypervigilant state anyway. I then joined the military that teaches you how to be at comfort in chaos. Mm. And I was then taught, or it was like, you know, it was the only thing I knew to relieve that stress was to drink. And yes, listen, it, I wouldn't call it de-stress. I'd call it numbs. It absolutely, it's a smoke screen, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And really this is the whole thing, you know, break point is about um, short-term discomfort for long-term gain. The opposite of that is, is um, short-term comfort, which leads to long-term pain. And that's exactly it. That's what alcohol does. Yes, in the immediate, it offers you that respite. But really, at the end of the day, it does nothing but compounds that issue. Mm. It never actually alleviates any kind of stress, does it? Is that correct? No, absolutely. For, for, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So whatever sedating effect you get from alcohol, you get a corresponding feeling of anxiety when it wears off. Okay, simple mm. physiological fact. But also what you need to factor in here is, although when you take alcohol, your brain is dulled, your body isn't, your body goes into stress mode because of all this cortisol and adrenaline that gets pumped into it. So you're not resting at all. You might feel sedated, but your body's doing the opposite. It's going into this stress mode. And the other key point here is, if I give you something to eat, like a pizza or a kebab, something that's hard to digest, you eat it and it might take a day or two, but eventually your body breaks it all down, et cetera, et cetera, and gets rid of it. Difficult mm. experiences are broken down by your brain in REM sleep. Okay, REM sleep is an odd part of sleep. It's where we dream. Your brain lights up almost as if you're fully awake. When you drink alcohol, because your brain's sedated, you find it very difficult to get into REM sleep. So if you're drinking, one of the best stress relievers is a good night's sleep, okay? Mm. Yeah. If you're drinking, you're robbing yourself of that. I quite often see it when people are grieving Okay, somebody close to them dies, and it's a horrendous thing. I'm not belittling it at all, but there is a natural and normal psychological grieving process that you go through, and it can take a long time to go through it, and you may never quite get over that person's death, but there's always a hole there, but you learn to live with it. Yeah. But when you're drinking, you don't. You cannot go through that process. What alcohol is doing, although it's giving you that illusion of, oh, I feel slightly better when I've had a drink, on the one hand, it's not because your body's going into this stress situation, but also mm. you're robbing your brain of it, its ability to kind of get to grips and assimilate experiences and, and to get on top of them. Mm. Now, apart from all of that, and I can absolutely talk to this, to, and I'm sure you can as well from my personal experience, the best mm. I feel in life, it's not, it, and it never was after a drink, it's after waking up after a good night's sleep and doing a bit of exercise, going for a run and feeling good. What it comes down to is letting your brain chemistry get back to normal. When, you're when your brain chemistry is normal, you, you, you might not think of yourself as resilient or tough or whatever, but when your brain chemistry is normal for most people, that's when they're at their best. Um, yeah. And that's that you at your most resilient. So to be able to do deal with these difficult things, you, it's actually really counterintuitive to be taking alcohol. Yeah, absolutely. I do resonate with that massively. And also, I, I mean, you talked about in your book there about uh, when it comes to REM sleep, REM sleep, I think it was lab rats that um, I think they deprived them of REM sleep and they died within six to eight weeks. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, I'm not sure how they deprived them of the sleep, but... <laughs> They, they do they do a similar thing this, i've written this in the book but it's really interesting they do a similar thing with humans so you, you they human volunteers you turn up to a um like a sleep center they attach sensors to you and they monitor you when you go into rem sleep they wake you up so they're letting you sleep but they're not letting you get rem sleep and the problem they have with it is within a very short space of time people become very depressed very disorientated and they can't go through it they take themselves voluntarily off it so they quite have to have problems with these things because people won't finish the course yeah. it's sleep deprivation is torture and yet when you're drinking alcohol you're voluntarily putting yourself into that situation 
Yeah, no, hundred percent. And uh, what was I going to say? I was going to say around that sleep because um, selection. Yeah, it's like selection, isn't it? But um, there's no alcohol on that. But um, yeah, the one the one thing for me, William, I think you'll probably uh, I'd like to ask your opinion on this, whether it was the same for you. But when I actually gave up drinking, I always talk about that moment because I actually, in one of my books, Battle Ready, I actually talked about um, I, I created this thing called the Purpose Pyramid. And basically, the purpose pyramid was obviously a pyramid. And then in the center of the pyramid, you would put the issue, like something that was consuming a lot of your life. Mm -hmm. And that for me was alcohol. So I put alcohol inside the pyramid. And I asked myself three questions. First of all, do I enjoy it? And I'm talking long term here, you know, on the, on the general, not in the short term. Do I enjoy it? Does it add growth? And that could be financially or spiritually or whatever, you, however you look at it. And then the third question was, does it help others? And to each of those questions, it was a cross. Yeah. So for me, the purpose pyramid, the whole point of it is if you've got a cross next to every question, the subject matter needs to disappear. Do you know why is it still in your life consuming the majority of your life and you're still doing it? That is utter madness. So anyway, that was that was really a big decision for me. But anyway, when I got through that, I actually broke the back of, 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 of getting into sobriety or clarity, whatever word you want to put to it. It was for me, take away the alcohol. It was the fact that I had had something that was controlling me mm -hmm. and I could not stand that. That's why I was a pain in the ass in the military to be quite honest <laughs> yeah, not an ideal career really is it <laughs> not, not an ideal uh, soldier yeah. uh, but for me it was the whole thing about control i finally you know i was i was alcohol's bitch there was no yeah. doubt i was its bitch and it would tell me exactly what to do where to go and how much to spend even when i didn't even have the money to spend on it it would make me find find the money from somewhere, beg, steal, borrow to get it, and it would make me go to the, you know drink and everything else. So for me, when I'd actually conquered that, it was breaking the back of alcohol that has made it's, it's, it's opened my it's put my life on on um, on widescreen on on high definition widescreen. And the reason I say that is because I broke that and I, I regained control. I now know I can replicate that with anything in my life. And really, the thing for me I'm talking about there is, is you taking ownership, putting yourself in the driving seat. And really, we're doing, um, we're doing this challenge in January, uh, which is the dry January challenge. We've got a 10K race at the end of it. And the reason we've come up with this idea, which is Dean's brainchild, Dean's on the call tonight, Dean Newman, uh, who I used to work with. It's quite an interesting story, Dean. I, hope, I know you don't mind me talking about this, but I, I work... Uh, William was introduced to Dean before but basically Dean used to work for me and this is when I'd sort of first got back to the UK just stumbled across the TV stuff started my business called Breakpoint Dean was in sort of that event space so we hooked up together started doing stuff together he was brilliant at what he did loved his work and everything but there was this other side to him and that was the other side that would then go out, get absolutely steaming drunk at the weekends, all kinds of stuff up his nose and what have you, and really bad choices. And I could see so much of myself in Dean. And I just knew that it, it was never, no matter how well he performed, there was always going to be this thing that was pulling him back and never allowing him to be himself and really give his best. So it's really good, great, Dean, to have you on this call, not only on this call, but Dean came back to me he went through he went to actually through the steps of AA uh, which I know a lot of that is about forgiveness the initial stages of that so he reached out to me I think I was one of the few that actually accepted his apology <laughs> um, but I, it's because as soon as he said to me after I, I don't drink anymore I knew I was left with what was what was great about Dean so anyway, Dean's come up with that 10k race and that is really to give people a target at the end of the dry January phase and it's not about people it's not the focus isn't to make people give up the focus is to let people just understand that they are in control the question is are you dependent are you addicted and the majority of people whether they are or not will as you know William say no of course I'm not I can take it or leave it so the question to that is well if you can can you do 30 days 30 days in January just to give your body a break. There will be some people that go that 30 days 
as I did this six or eight weeks, I did up to filming SAS, and they feel so good that they, they'll want to continue that journey. Some won't, some will, um, but that's the reason we're doing that in, in January. So anyway, there's going to be a link to that. I think Laura's going to send that out. I'll put it on the chat. Um, but what would you say... Um, what would you say to anyone? Because I know there's a lot of people that, they, you know, I can see some of the chat coming up here. Some people are saying, well, I get bored. Um, or I, and a lot of people, I mean, I've spoken to people personally who say, well, it's, I, I'm only drinking, I don't want it. They're starting to question their drinking. And I think everyone being on this call tonight and the, the 800 people that are registered for this webinar, they're all asking themselves that question what really is drink offering me and what would you say to anyone that wanted to start on that journey that start to feel a bit scared about the fact of how are they going to go down to the pub how are they going to tell all their mates how are they going to handle the boredom have you got any advice for that yeah there, there's, a, there's a few points to say there one when you're trapped in it it can be very difficult imagining life outside of it um to a degree those early days, you need to trust the system a bit. I've kind of explained how it interferes with your brain chemistry and it interferes with your sleep. And to a degree, when you stop, you immediately do feel worse for a few days. So you, you've got to kind of keep trust, as I say, trust in the system and know that it will get better. I, I sometimes liken it when, when I was drinking. This is, I, I quite often think in an analogies, but I think when I was drinking, it was almost like I was clinging onto this life raft. And that was alcohol. Alcohol was the life raft and these stormy seas was my life. And it was alcohol was the only thing keeping me afloat. And that's why it was so difficult for me to give up because it was like someone was saying to me, you're in this stormy sea, give up your life raft. It was like, but it's the only thing I've got. It's, you know, I've had so many thought I had so many troubles at the time, you know, wife, had young kids, money problems, so many things, didn't like my job, all the rest of it. It's like the only thing keeping me going was this life raft, this alcohol that I was holding on to. And what I actually found was when I let go of it, I was actually standing in three foot of water. Okay. I didn't need it. I was absolutely fine without it. There was another thing. I don't know if you remember that, um, you know, the Indiana Jones film, the Holy Grail, the one with um, Sean Connery in it. And he has to do these challenges. He's trying to get to the Holy Grail and he, he steps out and there's just this drop you know, mm. thousand foot drop and he just has to step onto it and he eventually steps and it's an illusion. There's a path there. And that's what it felt like for me to stop in because I was like, I'm never going to enjoy social events. How am I going to deal with stress? What's going on holiday? We've got Christmas coming up. What's Christmas going to be like without alcohol? Um, and actually when I went for it, it was like, I can do all of these things. I can enjoy all of these things. Boredom is a classic one because you know, I've spoken about some of the physiological parts of drinking, but obviously there's a lot of psychological parts to it. And one of which I, I call it craving, but it's like that obsessive thinking about something. And it doesn't necessarily need to be that full on white knuckle really needing it, but just it's a distraction. So like yeah. it's Friday night, it's whatever you're sat there. And this is the dynamic I found I would sit there on a Friday night and I couldn't really concentrate on anything. I was bored because I wanted a drink. And what I realized was alcohol, and I keep going back to this, but keep in mind what it is. It's a sedative. It just makes you feel slightly dulled. It cannot make anything more interesting. It can only dull things down, but it can allow you, if you're obsessing about it. So say I sit down on a Friday night and I put a box set on, Right but I'm not really thinking about it because I'm thinking about, I want a drink and I could I have a drink. Should I have a drink? Wouldn't it be nice to have a cold beer or a glass of wine? I'm not concentrating on the box set. Mm. If I then have a drink, I'm getting rid of that obsessive thinking. So I can actually concentrate on what's going on. So my takeaway of that is when I'm not drinking, I'm bored. I just can't engage in anything, but with a drink in hand, Oh, it's a different story. Same without with mates, you know, like yeah. I'm sat there because I'm thinking about, should I, shouldn't I, can I, can't I have a drink? I'm not actually concentrating on the conversation. So there's a lot of dynamics here and it might appear that alcohol is giving you something. It might appear that, oh, I'm bored. So I need a drink to engage interest, mm -hmm. but it's not actually the case at all. And again, you know, what age did you start drinking? I was 14 when I started drinking. Was I bored for 14 years? Never interested in anything up to the, of course not. It, yeah. It's just when you introduce this drug or any drug, 
you find you can't quite concentrate or enjoy things without it. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's actually giving you anything. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, you know, the psychological, you know, it just becomes part of your program. Mm. And that any, any habit you repeat time and time again gets offloaded from the frontal cortex into the subconscious where it becomes part of the program. It's exactly the same as when you learn to drive. You know, initially, different to dream. Well, I don't mix the two for sure. But, um, you know, when you learn to drive, you've got this cognitive overload. You know, you're, you're thinking, how the hell am I ever going to get, to, you know, there's people come from all directions. There's, you've got brakes, clutches, all sorts of stuff. And you think, how am I ever going to do this? Before long, you know, you, you're driving to work after you pass your test. You've got a Costa coffee, listening to a podcast. You're on the phone to whatever it is. And you can't even remember how you got there because that behavior is 95% of your program. And that's mean means you do things without even thinking about it. It's become the program. It's offloaded from the frontal cortex and it becomes your behavior. And that really is, you know, it's like for me, you know, the natural, if I didn't allow myself to pull it up from the subconscious that time, Foxy said to me, come on, let's go and get smashed after the eight weeks of, of sobriety. If I'd have not spent just a second just thinking in that moment, I'd have gone straight into that drinking because the program takes over. And the program, it's almost like my frontal cortex, which is only 5% of the life around you. If I get up one day and say, right, I'm not going to drink today. You know, it's a Friday. Today, I'm going to make a stand. What will basically happen is you very shortly afterwards, or as the, as the day sort of gets towards the later part of the day when you will be having a drink, your subconscious mind steps in there and says, can you not remember how we do things around here? And that is to then reach for a drink. And that's why it does take a lot of effort to really push through that. The whole concept of breakpoint is stepping into that short-term discomfort, but being conscious in that moment. And that's what I believe, you know, when you want to give up drinking, first of all, you've got to have a why. And, you know, I, I know by listening to your story, because it's just like my, mine, I know by listening to Dean's story, because it was just like, like mine, that you can create a why quite easily. I mean, if you could write down, and I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, getting stuff down onto paper, um, you know, instead of typing stuff out, when it comes to stuff that you really want to get through, I do believe that when you scratch on the surface of a paper, it actually etches on your brain. Mm -hmm. You won't get that when you type on a keyboard. But really start to write down two columns, you know, of all the things that drinking over the years has given me. My best moments on alcohol. You know, and that is that will be a very short list. And then all the all the all the benefits to, to stopping drinking. For me, it was an absolute war when I was like realized that drinking was just not serving me whatsoever anymore. You know, it was an absolute war to understand. Right. I had to think about I had to construct my whole weekend around drinking. When I first stopped on that Friday night, um, I think it was when I made a stand. It was it was incredible because my phone was going crazy with all my mates going, come on, when are you going to give in this this bullshit about stopping drinking? That was going crazy. And I was sat there in this despair going, what am I going to do? It was Friday night and my brain was like just I then realized very shortly of all the the amount of my life that was consumed by that habit. Mm. And then it wasn't very long because I pushed through that. It wasn't very long till I started to fill those gaps. You know, I started a business. Me and my wife would actually be, she wasn't, my, Laura wasn't my wife then, but um, we would be sat there on a Friday night starting to put a business plan together. And I was just sat there thinking, even the day before now, I'd have been in the pub, mm -hmm. in the warm up to the weekend. And, and then if it was like the Sunday, I would like lose all my week until about Wednesday when I was starting to feel a little bit okay. And then Thursday's back on it again. And it's just mm -hmm. like, it, like I said before, I was I was the alcohol alcohol's absolute bitch. Now listen, we could sit here and we could talk. You've got so much knowledge, William. It's incredible. Um, I'll just want to say you've got so much knowledge, William. It's incredible, and I'd like to urge everyone that is starting to question and really wants to to understand the roadmap to to taking away this really negative habit and start to live a longer and happier life. It's not that not a selling point in itself you know another thing i'll say on that is like i used to question where's that energy you used to have you know when you was you're never going to get it back you know when, the same as when you were a kid but that energy that zest for life you were certainly not going to find it by having a drink the night before
you'll never, you know, and really for me, as soon as I got alcohol out of the way and I wake up every, I take myself to the day and I don't let the day walk all over me. You know, I take myself to the day and appreciate every day. And, and it's, it, it's absolutely incredible. So one thing for me is like this book has given me a lot of information that I wish I had when I started to, uh, to question alcohol. And I think that's what we need to arm ourselves with. We need to arm ourselves with knowledge. Knowledge is the, the one thing that's going to get us through um, and, and to, to really justify the actions that, of, of what we're taking, you know, of why we're taking that action. I mean, really, for me, when you understand the psychological, the health, I mean, a lot of people still don't understand, still don't get it, that can, it, it causes cancer. Hmm. Is, is it is it a class one uh, carcinogenic or yeah yeah so so the, the the medical branch of the world health organization have classified it a class one carcinogen which puts it in the same category as cigarette smoking and asbestos so zero health benefits no matter what you read about these you know glass of wine is good for you it's zero health benefits yeah absolutely now william you're obviously a lawyer a solicitor, a solicitor or a lawyer yeah, is yeah solicitor yeah <laughs> solicitor you obviously don't need to go out there writing books for the greater good of humanity so why why have you done that so it felt it, it was partly like just setting the record straight because it felt like alcohol was very much misunderstood secondly it was entirely selfish it did i completely agree with what you're saying you know writing things down is hugely powerful and i found it massively cathartic i think for me it was almost like a an exploration in itself um, and secondly, I, I, I mean, entirely separate to that, I, I've been I've done a couple of stints in AA um, and I, I, I knew from personal experience, a lot of people come into this. They have questions, you know, what's going on? Why am I like this? What, why can she have two drinks and I can't? I have to keep going. What's changed? What's different? And I kind of knew that I had a lot of not all of it, but a lot of the information there, you know, the physiological, the chemical, the psychological processes at play. So it's kind of a medley of those things that made me write the book in the first place. Yeah, well, listen, I'm, I'm really, uh, I certainly, although I don't drink anywhere, I'm certainly pleased that you do, because I know how many people this benefit. I, I saw on uh, Amazon before that Alcohol Explained had something like 6,000 reviews or something like that, over 6,000 yeah. reviews. So it just proves how popular this topic is becoming. And I, and I think, you know, just by the people signing on for this webinar, it's like one of our most popular webinars because, and that just shows you that people are starting to question, why am I doing this? Um, and, and really, you know, at the end of the day, I think we should be living every day and getting the most out of every day that we can. You know, alcohol offers you a short term buzz um, with long term um, real negative um, aspects to it. So have we got any questions before we sort of sign off and there thank is, everyone for yeah. an amazing evening? That's First any all, questions. There have been a couple of people in the chat saying they've read William's book and they've absolutely loved it and it's helped them stop and it's helped them quit. So there's a lot of love and gratitude going on for you in the chat there so i'm just going to that's nice gonna to hear william's website in there now um and the first five books are available on on there is that correct yeah the, the first five chapters of the first book is on there so you oh, you the could first go five, the yeah. first five chapters <laughs> cool, that'd be a night, wouldn't it <laughs> He's giving you three that he's not written yet. Yeah. <laughs> Better get writing, yeah. Um, but there is something that I just like, I've been picking up a theme about Christmas and Christmas parties in the chat. And I just wondered if you could talk, because we heard this this morning when we were listening to the last part of the audio bit, and I thought this was so brilliant. And if you could just maybe just speak around this, is that when you are the sober one, drunk people kind of become your secret weapon. <laughs> Because there comes a point in the evening where they really do not care whether you're drinking or not. So I just like, there's a lot of people like really struggling with this whole Christmas parties, peer pressure. What am I going to do? So if you could just maybe talk around that a little bit, just because it's yeah. Very so, 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 I mean, firstly, people are interested in this topic. So if you go out and say, I'm not drinking, you'll, you'll have people asking you about it. But the interesting thing is you can quite often get away with not even being asked. So, so, I will go to the pub, I'll go there, there's a lot of alcohol-free beers now, and I'll order one and buy around or whatever and sit down. 
um, and, and people don't even realize they don't even notice that you're not drinking um, and what I also found the dynamic is you know you turn up an event um, and people say what you're drinking it's like oh well you know or a soft drink or an alcohol free beer and then there's like a buzz of conversation around it but pretty soon that dies out. And again, you kind of, you build it up in your head thinking it's going to be this massive thing, but it isn't. Because at the end of the day, people are only interested in their own drinking. You know, mm. if people are, if, if people want to drink, if they're enjoying alcohol, certainly from my perspective, when I was a drinker, if I was out at a party, as long as I was drinking, I didn't really care about anyone else. Um, mm. And I think that's absolutely true for other people. So again, it feels like it's this massive thing going to these Christmas parties, whatever, but you just do it. One of the big tips I would say is make sure you've got an exit strategy. Okay. It's not ideal being stuck there. And I think I mentioned this in the book and I don't like to be judgmental, but the fact of the matter is people are really irritated when they've been drinking. And I usually find like, so I've got my Christmas party tomorrow. I've already made my excuses that I'm going to have to leave after a couple of hours because people are all right for a couple of hours but then after that, they start to get really irritating. They start talking. They start into like really coming into your personal space. They start spitting when they talk. They're repeating themselves. So, so make sure you've got your exit strategy there as well. Yeah, I think with that, I, I think that's good if you go in there, you know, because if you go in there and it's like, oh, just not having a drink tonight, you haven't really got anything to back it up. You, you'll get pestered. But if you like, if you're there and say, well, tomorrow morning I've actually got open heart surgery or something like that. You know, <laughs> you don't have to be as severe as that. But go in there with something that that really makes them real. Oh, they can't have a drink anyway. And there's nothing more empowering that than that. You know, I actually, I actually think I, I take great pride in it now. By you know, when someone says, "Do you want to drink?" and I take great pride in saying, "I don't drink." Mm. It's absolutely amazing. It, it's brilliant. So. um so yeah, it is it is a tough time, especially if there are anyone that is at this moment in time starting to think about it because it's going to be a tough, a tough conversations and tough sort of social um, scenarios in your head, in your head, yeah. and you're the one. At the end of the day, this is what we do: we fear we 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 fear the future and we regret the past. We don't actually just live in the moment and just go in there with an intention, live in the moment and just push through it. And, and really, if you, you, you want to empower yourself, just do it once and you'll start to feel that it will be so empowering for you to wake up that next morning and feel have that clarity and know that you, you actually put yourself in the driving seat. So anyway, um, I'm going to have to wrap this up. I'm very conscious of, of William's time here. We could talk to him all night long. <laughs> Maybe we should do a part two in the new year at some stage. Um, but it's been brilliant, mate. I really do appreciate uh, your time. I appreciate this amazing book. We've got the, uh, if people want to get hold of William, um, Lord, if you just pop that in the chat, we're going to send that out to everyone as well. So please go on to William's uh, website, Alcohol Explained, where you can find out uh, more information you can get his book maybe you've got someone that you in all seriousness you've got someone you would like to buy the book for um and um that would be an amazing christmas present but i'd just like to say to everyone have a great christmas and please do sign up for the um dry january challenge which is going to be amazing and um there is a run at the end of 10k run you can do that with us at pippinford park in East Sussex, maybe William, we can probably um, convince him to be there. I'm going to be there. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And um, if you get them to say yes on a on a public forum, they've got no chance to actually pull out. So that's brilliant. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we'd like you to join us. There's going to be amazing people like William and all a load of other people at the event. There's going to be talks. There's going to be a big community of people at the end of the run. Uh, and if you can't make it, you can do it virtually. So the whole thing is, is putting yourself in the driving seat of that habit and saying, yeah, I am in control. And if you do want to go back to drinking, that is your choice. Um, but for a lot of people, they'll start to see that there's a better life beyond, uh, beyond alcohol. So anyway, thanks again. And um, we'll see you on the next one. Have a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.